All right, so we're back. I made a YouTube video also of those first steps. You can link to it there and I will post the Zoom that we just did for that part of the lab. And now I'm gonna jump into fuzzy overlay. So fuzzy overlay is another completely different approach to doing overlay analysis. And it's awesome. It incorporates fuzzy logic. Fuzzy logic is, and allows us to get more conceptual and more complex in the way that we weight and rank inputs into a, an analysis. So previously we think of the world as the result is discrete. We put them in these classes, ranks of one to five, and then we weight them. But we know that there's uncertainty, which is one of my favorite things. Um, and that we don't necessarily know how processes operate. And we want to preserve the continuous nature of the input data sets and fuzzy logic allows us to do this. So let me give you a definition. Um, this is what I just said. Uh, weighted over, let me, re I'll go with the slide. Weighted overlay and weighted sum use discrete data sets and fuzzy logic, fuzzy overlay allows us to incorporate the continuous nature of data as well as our uncertainty about how processes work and apply fuzzy logic through membership classes to our input data sets. So there's more background on fuzzy logic, but basically it provides an approach that allows expert semantic, like meaning descriptions to be converted into a numeral, numerical spatial model to predict the location of something of interest. So we think that, um, so let me take aspect for example. So in fire hazard, we think that south facing slopes are, are the most hazard and everything else isn't, right? That's what we did last time. It was binary. It was in or it, was, or it wasn't. But what if we think that other areas still have a risk of fire hazard, but south facing slopes are the highest risk and the closer you are to south, so north, south, east, west. So as you go from south to north, the fire hazard diminishes. So as you go from 180, anywhere away from 180, the closer you are to 180, the higher the fire hazard, and the closer you get to zero or 360, the lower the fire hazard. That's what fuzzy logic allows us to do. It allows us to apply curves to our input data sets to ex explore and explain um, more nuanced what the, has, what the inputs should be in, a, in an overlay analysis. So it, uh, I have here realistically model scenarios without discrete variables. So what you do in fuzzy overlay is instead of ranking your inputs, you apply fuzzy membership classes to your inputs. So you take your continuous data and you apply a semantic fuzzy membership class that converts the input data from whatever beautiful continuous surface it is into a range of zeros to ones but float, so it's not binary. So zero is the least likely, one is the most likely, based on whatever model you're applying to that input. So I'll, I'll explain. Um, I'm going to skip some of these slides and have you read through them. But basically it does it in a float, so zero is completely unsuitable and one is completely suitable, rather than zeros and ones, yes or no. So basically what you do is you define the problem, you get your data. So we have already defined our problem, it's fire hazard. We're getting our criteria. So in this example, I'm gonna stick to continuous surfaces. So for fire hazard, for the fuzzy overlay, I'm going to have you just work with elevation, slope, and aspect. And we're gonna apply fuzzy membership classes to those continuous surfaces. So then you assign your fuzzy membership classes and then you overlay them in a certain way. So there's fuzzy overlay operators and they're kind of Boolean, right? Because we're going back, Boolean, yay, and, or, right? So there's, so it's more complex. So I'm spending, okay. So that's the basis of fuzzy overlay. In that PDF that I gave you in the resources, I've taken this screenshot from that PDF. So let me walk you through this. So here's just an example of how Boolean logic versus fuzzy logic works. So Boolean is that strict binary overlay, yeses and ones, and fuzzy logic is a range. So here we have people with different heights. So Fred is three foot two and Sue is seven foot two. 
So Sue is definitely tall and Fred is definitely short. So he gets the zero and Sue gets the one, but the different heights in between are more nuanced. Mike at five, five is more short, but not completely short. So he gets a point two. And John at six, one, given the range of data that we have is 0.5. I mean, he's tall by general standards, but with Sue in the mix, he's got a 0.54. So it's more scaled on a range of zero to one in a linear fashion. So this would be a linear. And here's how age would be. So you go from zero, uh, from 27 to 65. In Boolean oldness, you're old. Don't trust anybody over 30. You're old if you're um, if you're over 30, and you're not old if you're 30, 27 to 30. But with fuzziness, you have a range of zeros to ones based on your age. So that's how fuzzy logic works. It's, it sounds more complex than it actually is. But you just have to, right? So that, that kind of makes sense, I hope. But basically what you do is you apply these fuzzy membership classes to each of your inputs to fuzz them up and then overlay them. Um, so the basic premise is that we don't necessarily know how things, how things go. I'm going to, this is more, this is more reading. I'll let you read this offline because I really just want to get to the, that makes sense, right? Basically you have discrete boundaries and weighted overlay and weighted sum and fuzzy overlay applies fuzzy logic. So we can apply these membership classes to our input data instead of ranking our input data in a scale of one to five or a scale of one to four or a scale of one to ten we put it into a continuous surface in a scale of zero to one based on whatever membership we apply to that data set and those are the fuzzy membership classes so i'm going to briefly go through these fuzzy membership classes and then i'm going to we're going to watch a youtube video that is i think really helps explain this so here are the different membership types. Ah, sorry. Don't make that a meme of me. Ah, sorry. So linear goes in a range of zero to one. You can have linear in either way, depending on what data you, you think it should go and you assign that in the box. But in this example, anything that's 200 meters gets a zero and anything that's close to something. So this would rank a distance grid. So say you have distance in your grid. Anything that's close is good, is high or high risk or high suitability, what it is, and anything that's far away, up to 200 meters, um, gets a zero. So that's a linear. Small membership class applies, so distance from power lines is this example. As the distance from a power line increases, it's more expensive to access, and it's less likely they'll be part of a favorable set and this is using small to account for the need for transformers, electrical transformers. So you may have more transformers in the middle to, to attenuate this risk, but um, with small, anything that's close is, it goes on a curve. So you have this midpoint of this curve. So it varies by distance. So say at this, you know, at these distances, you may still have transformers. Anyway, they apply this kind of a range. This is called small. Large does the opposite. So large is the opposite. The farther the locations, here's the example, the farther a location is from a landfill, the more likely they'll be favorable. So say this question is where to site a house and we want to be far from a landfill. So you don't, you know, instead of being linear, you can apply this large membership class and it assigns the values in the distance grid in a range of zeros to ones based on how, um, you know, the farther away you are, the better it is. The closer you are, the worse it is. But it gives it more of, instead of linear, it applies this kind of a curve. Hopefully that makes sense. And then near us is what I gave you in the aspect example. So here's land cost. So this, say you think that things are really good. If this is the price point that you want to emulate, something between 50 and 75. And greater than 75 is bad, and less than 50,000 is bad. So you, you reclassify things on a curve, and near does that. And then there are variations on the theme when we get into the tool. So these are, instead of ranking on a scale of one to five, et cetera, we're applying a membership class based on how we think things 
may work in this process that we're particularly uncertain about. And it reclassifies our continuous surfaces into ranges of zeros and ones. So hopefully that makes sense. This is, I've never played a YouTube video on a Zoom, so I'm gonna try this. Any questions? No. Hopefully this will make sense. I love this person. Um, I think her name is Lauren Bennett. And she is, um, I don't know how to, I'm gonna maximize this, I guess. She is the lead of spatial uh, statistics at Esri. Can you, it's fuzzy now, but you can see it, right? Let me see if you can hear it. So here she's gonna, I'm just gonna play the first part of this, the first four minutes. And this is a really awesome demonstration of fuzzy overlay. And then we're gonna do our own. At Big Bear Lake in the San Bernardino National Forest, there are a number yeah. of endangered and threatened species that the National Forest Service is working to protect. The bald eagle is one of those species that is going to be the focus of our analysis today. We want to model the habitat of the bald eagle. And to do this, we're going to look at three variables that we know are related to bald eagle nesting. And we're going to overlay those variables. First variable that we want to look at is a land cover variable. We know that bald eagles prefer to live in areas that are not too sparsely covered by forest and not too densely covered by forest. Anywhere between 40 and 70% tree cover is ideal. We also know that bald eagles prefer to live in areas that are close to large bodies of water. I've run a 500 meter buffer, 1000 meter buffer, and 1500 meter buffer, and we can use the results of this analysis in our overlay. Lastly, we know that bald eagles avoid urban areas, major roads, and any other sort of human disturbance. So we can include that in our overlay analysis as well. But we also know that bald eagles don't make decisions based on discrete variables and polygons like the ones we see in our map. In order to more realistically model the habitat of the bald eagle, we're going to take advantage of some of the enhancements to spatial analysis in ArcGIS 10, specifically some of the new fuzzy logic tools. I've created a model which is going to take each of those three variables and reclassify them using the new fuzzy membership tool. The graphs in my model represent the methodology that we're using to reclassify those variables, but we'll take a, a closer look at that in just a minute. Next, those reclassified continuous surfaces are overlaid using the fuzzy overlay tools. The end result is a suitability map of bald eagle habitats. So let's take a look at those reclassified variables. The first variable that we want to look at is the distance from Big Bear Lake. The graph shows us that the closer we are to Big Bear Lake, the higher the suitability. And as we get farther away from the water, the suitability decreases. Next, we can look at the human disturbance variable. The graph shows that there's a linear relationship and that when we're very close to urban areas and that distance is small, our suitability is low. And as our distance increases from those human disturbance areas, the suitability increases. Last, we wanna look at the tree cover variable. Rather than saying that anything between 40 and 70% tree cover is suitable and everything else is unsuitable, we're able to use the fuzzy membership tools to more realistically model how tree cover is related to bald eagle habitats. We can see in the graph that those mid-range percentages are all considered suitable. And as we go to higher percentages and lower percentages of tree cover, our suitability decreases. So we're able to use these continuous surfaces and the fuzzy membership tools to more realistically model how these variables are related to bald eagle habitats. Now I want to run my model, which is going to take each of those three variables and overlay them using the fuzzy overlay analysis tools. The end product is going to be a suitability map, which shows us the areas that are most likely to have bald eagle nesting. In green, we can see the areas that are most suitable for bald eagle nesting. 
and in red, the areas that are the least suitable. We're able to use these new fuzzy logic tools to more realistically model complex phenomena that are not adequately modeled using discrete variables, and that's really powerful. Now I want to move on to show you some of the enhancements in next. Cool, right? So there are a few things in this video that, um, first of all, I like how she had the, the uh, I like how she- Network analysis in uh, GIS. Just 60 miles west of Big Bear Lake is the Angeles National Forest. You guys can watch more if you want. Um, I'm gonna go back to her spatial model. So she has the spatial model in here. Just so you know, she's already done Euclidean distance. So she's already, she, a lot of this stuff was already done. It's not like, so she calculated distance. She already has a distance that, these are all continuous surfaces before she put them into the fuzzy membership tools. And I like how she has the, um, the, I don't have the graphics in there. And then uh, she didn't talk about the fuzzy, which fuzzy membership overlay she ended up using. So we're going to do our own and I'm going to, we're going to, but hopefully that explains the fuzzy membership classes a little bit. Uh, I think that's a really good video. Okay, so this is the quote that more, what fuzzy mem logic allows us to do, what fuzzy overlay allows us to do is to more realistically model complex phenomenon that are not adequately modeled using discrete variables, and that's really powerful. That's like the take home point of that video. So with that, I'm going to stop the, um, the lecture part, and we're gonna go into our lab part, but uh, actually I take it back, a couple more things. So this is what she did. She took her Big Bear Lake, and she did suitability class, closer to the lake is best, and she used a small, Fuzzy membership class, urban areas, she used a linear, and tree cover, she used a near, this, the, the, the vegetation. It's best in this percent class, but other classes are still okay. Urban areas, it's best far away, so it was linear, and it's closest, she used small, it's closest to the lake, but maybe, you know, so that's what she applied in her model. What we're gonna do in our fire hazard model is going to take elevation, slope, and aspect, and we're gonna apply linear to elevation, large to slope, and near to aspect. So the idea is that anything that's high, as you go up in elevation, it's a higher risk. Slope um, at, we, we apply a large membership. So at the midpoint, at half of the midpoint of the range, it starts to get worse and then lower, like, so it's at least more um, scaled. And so at the middle, because sometimes actually fire propagation has its own uh, personality. Like sometimes fire, like as you fire, sometimes as the slopes start getting steeper, it starts to go really fast up the slopes or verse, verse, what's the other word I'm looking for? Vice versa, fast down the slopes. If it starts here, once it starts getting really steep, it can take on. So you might want to have, as slopes become more steep, be worse and then less worse as they're uh, flattening out or lower. But so you can apply a different membership class to, qu to qualify that in a way to cement, it's semantic, which means words, but is putting it into um, numbers in a range of zero to one. And aspect I explained with the near. So the closest it is to south is, is bad, is highest risk, but still there's risk as we go far away towards north. So that's what we're gonna do in our model. And I'm gonna jump into model builder and we're gonna build it. And then we're gonna explore, this is what she didn't talk about. Once you have your membership, you have your, your different inputs, but then you have to apply a different overlay function to it to get the output. So that's what she didn't go over. And here are some other links. And this is the end of the PowerPoints that I have on fuzzy overlay. So I'll stop this recording and then we can go back into the ArcGIS and do a toolbox where we can calculate this. Okay. Bye. <laughs> Bye this recording and I'll see you in the next one.